And so rather than spending a lot of time introducing each panelist, I'm just going to refer you to your agenda. Their brief bios are actually in the agenda. And I just want to jump right in. Let's start with you, Doug Baker. You're the CEO of Ecolab, a major global Fortune 500 corporation. And you've been engaged in education policy for many years. Why do you see the educational achievement gaps as a problem? Now that everyone's seated, I've given you a second yeah, to catch no, your breath. I mean, <laughs> Welcome. Well, I mean, there's a, uh, this is all, there could be a very long answer here. But at the end of the day, you know, all of us count on a healthy society. I don't care if you're in business, if you're an artist, if you're others. I mean, we all count on it. And you're not going to have a healthy society if you are withholding quality education from a significant portion of your population. And, and yeah, I could give you, will it hurt business? Well, sure, ultimately. But I think it's way beyond what its direct impact is on business. It's really the direct impact on the health of the community at large, about the potential of people that aren't getting the education and what you're doing to their ability to live up and rise up to their potential. So there's a big moral issue. There's ultimately an economic issue. I mean, go on and on. It's, it's not as simple as if we don't do a better job educating our kids in the Twin Cities, somehow large companies are going to be harmed. I honestly don't believe large companies will be necessarily directly harmed. I think it's a lot bigger than that, quite honestly, that the community will be harmed. Ultimately, if you have an erosion, you end up harming everybody involved who counts on the community. And I would say the system itself becomes under question because there's not fairness in terms of people's ability to get after opportunity. If you're precluded from day one of getting a shot at an education, which is a prerequisite for frankly competing in the world that we see today, not the one, the one that's been invented. So I mean, it's all those things. Well, thank you for that. I'm, I'm actually going to now turn over to Kathleen Harrington from a Rochester perspective. Anusha Nath and Rob Grunwald's report shows that these achievement gaps are as persistent and as relevant in greater Minnesota as they are in the metro. Um, what are you hearing from member, your members about education and its role in supporting Rochester and the surrounding communities? Well, I think it's not particularly generic to Rochester, but to all of Minnesota. We're, I don't think we're different. The achievement gap is driving inequities that can really affect the fabric of our society. Um, and that is of great concern. And if I could just editorialize here a little bit, I'd like to just congratulate Justice Page and President Kashkari for, and I'm from the East Coast, so I'm not Minnesota nice. I'm going to applaud you for saying, congratulations for saying, the Minnesota miracle does not apply to everybody in this state because it doesn't. And you have pointed it out, and it's time that that is not a politically correct thing to say. And what we hope will happen is that the discussion starts to focus on that. And we stop talking about graduating from college, and we talk about readiness to learn. We know what needs to be done, and we're not doing it. We know leadership in schools matter. We know readiness for kindergarten absolutely matters. And we're not doing it. So we applaud the, the disruptive conversation. It has to happen. We're concerned about the impact and what does it mean, but we want to have this conversation. We've seen what works in our community. We're seeing the University of Minnesota, Rochester, produce the future healthcare workers with no achievement gap, none. And it's 37% of kids of color, 57% first generation new kids, another 30 plus percent Pell Grant kids, no gap. We know what can work, we're not doing it, and you are forcing with this conversation these tectonic forces to come together, face each other, and duke it out. So thank you for that. <laughs> well, thank you for that. Um, so Charlie, under your leadership, the Minnesota Business Partnership has led policy change in early childhood and education fields for many years. Can you tell us a little bit about why the educational achievement gaps are an area of focus for you personally and the partnership? Sure. And I also want to thank Justice Page and Neil for pointing this out. There's a lot of issues out there that the business community is concerned about, everybody's concerned about, but you're right, this is a crisis. 
situation. It took courage for you to do this. And frankly, right now, in this kind of divided political environment we're, li we're living in, this is the kind of leadership and courage we need to get mm -hmm. things done. So thank you for pulling us together. I think that the two reasons the business community has uh, uh, focused on the achievement gap in particular, and this isn't new. This is since the business partnership started, which is the CEOs of all the large companies in Minnesota. Education was the first issue we tackled. It continues to be the top issue we tackle. We've been very involved in early education, but the achievement gap over the last 10 years has been our number one issue. And the reason we're involved, number one, as Doug said, it's a moral responsibility. The people who lead our companies in the state are members of the community. They raise their families here. Guys like Doug Baker went to high school here. We, we've grown this community. We love this community. It is a moral imperative that we address. What we believe is one of the most impactful and kind of heinous problems we've got in the community. So number one, it's a moral obligation for us to be engaged. And frankly, it's shameful, right? It's shameful what's happened here. We, we love Minnesota, and we have a lot to be proud of here. We have a great healthcare system. We have great parks. We have a good transportation system for a lot of our kids. They have great ACT scores. For us to have the worst education gap in the country is embarrassing. So for all those reasons, we've got to do it. Number two, as Doug said, it's not number one, but number two is we need talent. Right? We cannot afford to leave half of the, of the students of color in Minneapolis who don't get a high school diploma. We can't afford to leave them on the bench. By 2025, we're going to have 230,000 open jobs in this community, 230,000 jobs unfilled. At the same time, we're doing a disservice by not providing an equal opportunity to these particularly children of color around the state. That can't continue to happen. If that does continue to happen, we will lose uh, the economic movement we've got going. The economy won't strive. The economy doesn't strive. We don't lift up everybody in this community. So it's not only a moral imperative, selfishly, it's critical that we have the talent in this state so we can drive an economy that helps everybody. Well, thank the three of you from the leaders of our business community for kind of leading that initial part of the discussion about why this matters to you. I want to turn to our two lawmakers here. Representative Moran, you have a degree in early childhood education. You're a legislator. What are, are you hearing some of the same things that you've heard from the business community about be, it being a moral issue, about it being shameful, some of these educational achievement gaps? What are you hearing from members of your community? Well, um, it's definitely um, very shameful. And as a state who has such great outcomes for white students, we should be ashamed that we are so far behind for communities of color, for low-income community, and that we are not doing our best to ensure that every child is successful in school. Because we know that when kids are successful in school, they will be successful in life. It is that paramount that we um, work towards not just an adequate system, but a high quality educational system where every last one of our kids are being successful from pre-K to post-secondary education. And you know, I, I just think we're smarter people now. We know so much more about average childhood experiences. We know so much more about trauma. We know so much about brain development that investment in early learning so that kids are entering kindergarten, ready and prepared, reading by third grade. And of course, we know in this day and time, you have to be reading before third grade. Right? There's some expectation going into kindergarten that you can identify letters and words. And so it is really paramount. And you know, currently, um, legislatively, um, we have to do more. We have to be more intentional. I think we really have to do a better job of listening to communities of color, listening to the low-income community, listening to parents about what we, or what, what they believe works best for their children. Um, and, you know, we don't have a, a one-type system that fits all, right? We don't do that. So um, I don't know if you have another question for me, but. Well, I have lots more questions. <laughs> 
Uh, so maybe I could ask Jay Zhang then, Representative Zhang, you know, as a lawmaker, a former teacher in our public schools and a community advocate. I mean, I would ask you to start kind of with the same question. Why does this matter to you? But can you also potentially address why do you think that these disparities have been so persistent? So I'm a, I'm a child of refugee immigrants. My parents came to this country with no formal education, spoke little English, got me um, a good education, came back, and I decided, you know, what better thing to do than to come back and give to the community that has given me so much. Like, that's how I got into the education field. Um, at that time I graduated, it was during the recession, so, you know, a fresh college graduate, no job, looking for a job. I got into teaching by accident. One of the local charter schools in St. Paul hired me on as an EA, and then eventually um, I worked on getting my variance license to become a substitute teacher, so I was an in, uh, in-house substitute teacher. And, and while working there as an educator, um, I was seeing some of the, of the very same issues uh, that were happening when I was still uh, a student in school. And I was amazed by it. That's how I got involved in politics, wanted to see some bigger changes. I started organizing on a school board campaign. Um, and one of the candidates was an education reformer who now has a, heads a national education reform group to bring some changes. We, we're here still talking about the very same issues that we had when I was a student. Mm -hmm. Think about that. And here I am today as a lawmaker still battling these very same issues. Well, why that do we you think yesterday. that is? Why are we still battling those same issues? Well, one thing is we need to start ensuring that you have people who have walked our shoes to be here, to be here at the table, to put in their perspectives, and I think we just need to have um, the spine to stand up to all of these big thugs who think they can just bully us because they don't agree with us. And we're, you know, when that press release that you guys had came out, uh, Representative Moran and I uh, had a whole bunch of folks come into the state office building. Uh, they want to meet us, and they've been uh, having all these conversations. Oh, you know, you guys need to be very careful. Watch your back. I'm like, look, I didn't, I didn't run for a public office to get reelected. I came here to get some shit done. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Kathleen, earlier in your comments, you talked a little bit about um, getting shit done. Getting okay. <laughs> about what uh, some effective strategies that have worked in the Rochester area in, in closing some of the achievement gaps. Can you talk a little bit about what some of those are? Well, sure, but I, I, I don't think they're different than what's worked in Florida. Okay. And in my experience, I came from Washington, worked on No Child Left Behind, un knew the, my boss was the father of the governor who almost got defeated because of the um, work that he was trying to do in the legislature in Florida. But the first thing is, we have great research. We have validated, reliable research on what works, but it's oftentimes not even part of the political conversation. Um, we know, you know, there were some good things in No Child Left Behind, and there were some bad things. We know sledgehammers don't work, but we did learn from that that if a school fails for six years in a row, they're required to restructure. What happened with the 300 plus schools, like in North Carolina, for example, 160 of them had to be restructured. What changed was leadership. The principals in those schools changed, changed the culture, and changed the results. So leadership matters. We know early childhood intervention for special, for students of color, for low socioeconomic, and for students, first, first generation students, changes their results. If they're ready for kindergarten, you don't start with a gap. All of this talk about remediating the gap is, play, is a Band-Aid on a tumor. And we need to get to that root cause fast. So root cause, those are some of the things that work. Research is a guide, but it's not part of the conversation. And the other thing is political will to stand up to strong forces. That's what's going to have to change. Political will, and I think the question you started with of, let's put the child at the center, I just flip it to say, 
whose needs do we need to meet? Are we meeting the educators' needs? Are we meeting the management's needs? Are we meeting the children's needs? And mediating that has what's gotten us to here. If we could do like, and I don't want to sound like a Mayo sycophant, but what Mayo Clinic, our largest private employer, does in the state, puts the patient at the center, you get the results. You're measuring quality. And the last thing I'll say about what's worked is respect for and utilization of data. With analytics we have now, we have great opportunity for improvement, not punishment, but continuous quality improvement. And if the professions could embrace that as in the interest of the child, then I think we have some pathways to pursue. Representative Moran, you also talked a little bit in your opening remarks about the importance of early childhood education as one of the kind of um, policy solutions or considerations. What are some of the other policy things that you're thinking about in terms of education that you think either might work, have you seen worked, or could, you know, potentially promising solutions? So first I just want to say I, I definitely agree with the Supreme Court Justice and our president here of the Federal Reserve about looking at um, um, the Constitution because it's foundational. It just starts at the foundational place uh, within our Constitution that was, in, this language was enacted in 1857. Mm -hmm. 1857. And I think most of us know what was happening in 1857, right? And so policies were not always created equally for all to participate, right? And so I'm just asking us all to think about reimagining what education needs to look like in the 21st century. And so some of the things that I have worked on um, has been, you know, because today education doesn't live in a silo by itself. It is impacted by housing. It is impacted by homelessness. It is impacted by the ability to have a, a good job. It is impacted by trauma. It is impacted by many, many different experiences. And we can't not just focus on education in the 21st century by itself, because families don't live that way. So we need a, more of a comprehensive plan about creating better edu educational outcomes by one, investing in something like the promised neighborhood a promised neighborhood that's look at stabilizing families. You know, there was a program called Homework Stars at Home, where for so many kids who are homeless, they don't have time to focus on homework or reading a book. There's so many other factors that are impacting their everyday, daily lives that we, as a community, as a state, need to take into consideration in the 21st century. And so, with the, if you don't know about Promised Neighborhood, right now we have a Promised Neighborhood in St. Paul. We also have one in Minneapolis. And St. Cloud has an up-and-coming Promised Neighborhood, but it's also a partnership with like Northfield and Red Wing with the Educational Partnership Coalition. And what that looks, looks like is, you know, we get better outcomes when we know families are stabilized, when children have a home to go to. We have better educational outcomes when we work with the parent. We have better educational outcomes when we don't just look at that one child who may be failing. Not the school that's failing, but we look at and pay attention to the child who is need the extra support. We have to look at mental illness. We have to look at trauma. And how do we look at educational outcomes for all kids through a more holistic, comprehensive, view. And so we, uh, that is something I think the state of Minnesota is the only state right now who have invested in the promised neighborhood in the country to get the results where we see um, the, 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 um, the increase in outcomes for children in the school system. And listen, you know, when we talk about all children matters, we really got to start looking at the children. And I would say, you know, whether that means or it doesn't mean looking at a school system and just test results, 
right? Or that means looking at teachers and thinking that when we talk about children, we are somehow that we are against teachers or we are targeting teachers, you know, or blaming just parents for the outcomes of their kids. That doesn't work to have such a punitive system because we forget what is at the forefront of what we're trying to do, and that is to work to ensure that every child is working towards their best potential because we have surrounded them with the network of, of support that they need, and sometimes even with the family need, sometimes even with the community need, because you know what? We have a community, we have a country that we looked at Roe versus Wade. We have looked at no red wine. We have a school system that is based on a taxation of funding that is inequitable. It is so inequitable for those little small uh, communities of color looking at a tax base of how we're going to fund education. So we have to, not all this equal is needed. We need some equity here. <coughs> and look at it through that lens. Well, thank you. Um, so this question is, is for, actually, in just a couple of minutes, we're going to be opening up the pigeonhole, or I'll be taking questions from pigeonhole. So if you do have them, please feel free to start sending them in using those instructions up there. But I have one question for any of the panelists, but specifically I want to ask Charlie and Doug. We heard President Kashkari make a statement earlier that in the eyes of the law, this amendment would put children first. That means everything else would be second. In your roles as CEOs or leaders of organizations, what are your thoughts on that? Thanks, Charlie. I, well, I completely agree with the premise that you should put children first in this context. And we need a catalyst to drive some change. And the evidence is pretty clear. We've been talking about this achievement gap for years and years and years, yet we can't get any fundamental change. And we aren't getting any change that's driving any improvement in this gap. And the stats are clear. If you read the report from the Fed, there's many, many documents that will tell you that this is true. So I think the fact that we flip this and start putting children first, I think Representative Moran had it very clear that I do believe that's going to be one of the most important things for change. I guess the, the risk of getting this wrong, so teachers unions got their fear. I don't really have any fear. I think the fear of not doing anything is is much greater than the fear of doing something, there will be an unintended consequence of change. There always is. I would say, as we looked at it, I would guess that it's probably going to mean more spending in schools, not less. But if we spend too much but get better outcomes and close this achievement gap, it's a hell of a lot better than where we are today. Now, we would like to spend the perfect amount of money to get the perfect outcomes, but life never works that way. And so fundamentally, turning this, making the children paramount and their needs and their right, I think is exactly the right approach, given we've tried everything else. I think we need a catalyst, and I think this could serve as one. Thank you. Well, first, let me, let me thank Representative Zhang for changing the slogan for the Minnesota Business Partnership. <laughs> Getting shit done. <laughs> that is our news. Thank you. I'll give you some something. Yeah. Trademark it. <laughs> I already tweeted it, so <laughs> we are on our way. Um, I agree with with Doug, and I think this. Uh, I think that's the beauty of what Justice Page and and President Kashkari have done with this is putting the onus on the children. And it's going to be a tough fight at the Capitol, as the legislators have said. It's going to be a tough uphill battle, but. Uh, I don't see if, if that's the clear focus, and that's where we continue to talk about is this is about the children, not about the adults. It's about outcomes. It's not about inputs. And I think we got a shot, but we have to be focused like a laser on, on that as the principal goal. Okay. Thank you. Kathleen? And just add that um, it will be a tough fight politically. And as was said, we're in the midst of a country that is very divided, and a state that's very divided, um, and to be mindful of the fact that this is moving a lot of cheese. This is moving a lot of cheese and changing responsibility. And it's going to require a lot of breaking down of some power forces, unwrapping them, peeling back the onions, having honest conversations. Not pretty, not easy takes time, takes political 
courage. And the last thing I'd say is we've not taken a position on this in our the Rochester business community. And the one thing I would want to say is that uh, we've got to have the disruptive conversation, but we've got to learn from other industries too where failure was greeted with more litigation. Healthcare is a perfect example. And that's one area where employers are paying a big price. All of us are paying a big price. The cost of defensive medicine is really high. And it changed the practice of medicine. So we want to be careful here that the conversation is all about the kids and changing it so that the practices that we're not litigating to preserve status quo. We are moving forward, but we don't want to spend money on defending the status quo or um, creating defensive education system. Thank you. Are there, does anyone else want to respond to that? Or I can move to some of the questions that are coming into pigeonhole. Go, go ahead. <laughs> it, was, it was really about um, the constitutional amendment puts children first, essentially. And if you have any thoughts on, you know, implicitly that means that everything else kind of comes second. And I, and I agree with that. And, the, and it also really lays out really clear, if you read the, the new language, that it's a focus on children in public schools. So for all those who are fearful that it's opening a door up for something besides focusing on quality education in our public schools, um, it, it's just a, a no-starter. We want our kids to be successful in school, and the priority must absolutely be on every individual child in our school, in our public school system. Thank you. <laughs> um, so there's a number of questions here on pigeonhole that really kind of talk about political coalitions, and you know, as as President Kashkari mentioned earlier, how do you make that tent as big as possible? You know, what advice do you have for people if they're thinking about whether or not this is a priority for them in the upcoming legislative session? How do you how do you make a big what's a big tent strategy look like? Maybe I'll start with the business partnership from from your perspective. Oh, good. <laughs> since you were looking at me. <laughs> yeah, shouldn't have done that. Um, well, I think the most, it is gonna be a short session. Right? It's only a couple months long. It's one of the shortest we'll have. There's a lot of things on the table. The bonding bill's big. People are talking about a lot of other issues. Housing's important and other things as well. So I think you have to get this in front of their eyes. And I think the only way to do that, frankly, is to have a broad coalition, right? The people here, the people in this room, so it's a business community, minority community. Keith Ellison, my friend, is here. We haven't agreed on anything for 20 years. <laughs> right? But I love Keith Ellison, and we are shoulder to shoulder on this. And that's, that's what it's going to take to put this above kind of all the other scrum and the presidential campaigns and you know, all the acrimony. Um, if we can put together a coalition that's never been done before to fight for a cause that affects all of us, um, then I think we can be successful in a session that's going to be short and um, and busy. Go ahead, Kathleen. I unfortunately spent two more years of my life managing campaigns than I care to think. And this one is really interesting to think of how would it be done. And I think it has to be bottom up and top down. And because the time frame, if it was if we, there was more time, I'd say bottom up. Um, and the bottom up has got to be the most important. And we're look, going into a presidential year in a legislature that is very narrow. The margin is so thin in the Senate. There are such high stakes on the partisan level that if this gets partisanized, it's in trouble. So the messaging would have to be so clear. That bottom up coalition would have to be so clear. And this would have to be one of the um, most sophisticated efforts, grassroots efforts, I think, that would need to be done involving all parts of this significant coalition and many, many um, Nixon goes to China moments in this effort. By that I mean you want people saying, wow, they're together? Wow, they're together? To really capture people's imaginations and their hearts because this is a big paradigm shift. Um, and it may sound, and there are gonna be plenty who are afraid. I mean, many of my, my business people will be afraid. I've heard from my politicians. They don't like this because it's jockeying 
committees. It's jockeying power. Who's got the authority? Can the courts tell the legislature what they're going to do? All of those questions are going to have to be answered, but always come back to, and again, this is not a statement of support because I don't have my board's approval yet, um, but always come back to why are we doing this and we're here to meet the needs of the children. One of the, another one of the questions that's up on pigeonhole right now are what are some of the tangible ways that you can imagine a constitutional amendment might affect change for students? Representative Zhang, as a former educator, can you talk to us a little bit about your perspective on that? The second part of that question is why call for a large-scale support of this and not universal pre-K, for, for example? I'm going to refer to some of the policies that we were able to accomplish last year which speaks to why we need to get this done. Um, one great example of why we need to do more than just funding is uh, the bill, a bill that we passed uh, that was led by my colleague who's here today, uh, which Republicans were trying to make it controversial was the savings account for students. Education is the bedrock of our country. And for black and brown folk, folks like me, like me, we need an equal footing in education. What Representative Colley's bill does is it gives black and brown children, children from underserved communities, low-income families, in the same equal footing as their white peers. Another bill that my colleague, Representative Fu Lee, worked on in past, past, pre, past sessions is uh, data desegregation. When we sum all, an example, when we sum all Asian Americans into one group, the data skews people who look like me, first generation Hmong American, compared to a third, fourth generation Chinese American. It does not give uh, an equal picture of uh, the challenges that we're facing. And uh, when it comes to this constitution, when it comes to um, addressing the needs um, of our students who are our future, we have to, uh, think about the measures that we are going to be putting in place, the impact that it will have on many, many generations to come um, and when we um, are having this conversation at the legislature. And I, I, know, I know that uh, some folks may get uncomfortable, um, especially for those of you, especially my colleagues who, um, who come from a little bit more privileged background, uh, who may not have the same experience as me and represent Moran. Uh, but I want you all to know um, that uh, you have to also look at your background, where you came from, how you got to where you are today, and look at where we are today too, um, and try to see how you can be an ally instead of just um, texting me, shooting me emails saying, no, you can't do this, you can't do that. These folks don't come after me. Thank you. Does anyone else have any thoughts that they'd like to share on that idea, just in terms of what do you think are some of the maybe practical changes on the ground that we might see from this amendment? This is more process than specifics, because I think we know a lot of what works. But I would urge, and I think I would go back to my community and say, Let's sit and all talk about what has worked. Let's gather data. Let's understand what has worked in our own community, in other communities. So as this theoretical but important conversation is happening, there's a growing understanding of what does work. And that, you know, when you saw what happened in Florida, that amendment passed, quickly thereafter, there were policy agendas in place. So we should be having dialogue, too, about what does work? I mean, the question of universal pre-K. Is that the right answer? I would say that those resources should be highly targeted. We look in Olmstead County right now, we have more births than deaths, but we have more out immigration, out migration than in migration, immigration. But we know 20% of the new people in our county, in Olmstead County, are are babies of color and first generation. We know that 20% is going to be coming into kindergarten with less preparation, data shows us that, 
Why can't we be preparing for that now? So I would just offer, as we're having these conversations in communities, grassroots conversations about what this is, let's talk about what does it mean to, in terms of public policy, and start to develop some consensus around that. Let me just say this, that um, in regards to the legislature, in, in the legislature we have, currently we have 19 legislators of color, more than we have had in the history of Minnesota politics at one time. And I'm gonna tell you why that's important. It is important because, and I, I say this because, you know, I'm an African American mother who have to worry about the outcomes and the impacts of education on my child way different from many others. And it's that, you know, we keep saying we know what's working, but I think we do it well. We do, but sometimes we don't do what works. Oh, amen. Right? Uh, <laughs> we, we, that doesn't always happen. Yeah. And not everyone's worldview is always given a chance to impact the final decisions. But we have legislators of color in the legislature who have diverse experiences. And those experiences come from our own personal upbringing, how we had to bring up our own children or our sisters and brothers. And if, if we want to know what works, I would say to other legislators, ask, listen, engage, and also go into our communities and engage our communities because what works for our families are not always the solutions and the policies that we see moving through the body becoming law. And I will also say that we have some of the worst disparities for those reasons, because we have not done those things. Our, your worldview is not everyone's worldview, and we have to expand on what those world, uh, worldviews are and the solutions about creating the outcomes that communities of color need to be successful and to thrive, recognizing that all policies do not trickle down to all of our communities. They have not. And so just be open to know that you may not have the answers, right? And for all of us here, you know, look into our communities and say, what do you think works for you? You know, for that mother, who says that her child has been suspended, that he, that he or she goes into the classroom, and this 1800 model that we continue to use in the 21st century that puts the teacher in front of the classroom and students are supposed to sit still and just listen, does not work. We have to be creative, we need to be innovative, and we have to know that one solution does not work from everyone whether it's communities of color, whether it's urban or rural, it does not always work for Christ. We can all see that, right? Because we wouldn't have the outcomes we have right now. And it's not the burden, it's not always on individual, it's the policies that create the practices that we see continuously within our schools. And we have to do better. Well, thank you. You know, the, some of your comments remind me of some of the questions that we've heard when uh, talking with folks about the amendment. And one of the questions that often comes up is who gets to define quality? And we hear that in a number of contexts, and it's a, a question here on pigeonhole as well. I might ask our um, Doug or Charlie to to take a to try to take a stab at kind of a thought about quality. I think your thoughts about asking, listening, and engaging Representative Moran are maybe part of that conversation. Well, as I think Justice Page talked about earlier, the first folks who will have a chance to define what quality means are legislators. And I'm, I'm more hopeful that this doesn't have to end up in the courts, ever. Uh, given what I've heard today, given these legislators and their leadership on both sides of the aisle, uh, once it passes, and I do think it'll pass, if we can get on the ballot, I do think it's gonna, it's gonna pass, then it's gonna go to the legislature in the next year, which will be a new full year legislator, basically, legislature. And I'm hopeful, I'm optimistic, if we can put together the coalition that we need to generate the kind of effort it's gonna to take to get it on the ballot, and we come back and it's passed, then that legislature, I think, will define what quality is. Hopefully, reading the kind of things that you guys have written in your report, and uh, that uh, Kathleen talked about, in terms of what's worked in other parts of the country, that will be what quality is defined. And, and the great thing we love about the amendment is there's accountability built in. We think that's so important. Tests aren't the answer. I agree with you, Justice Page, to everything. But we have to let parents know how their kids are doing somehow in some kind of apples to apples comparison. 
So quality hopefully will not only be defined, but also measured. And if we can do that in the next session with your leadership, maybe we don't have to go to the courts and then we can get something way sooner and way less expensive than we thought we might. Go ahead. Yeah, I'll only add a um, couple things. One, this isn't the first time we've talked education. So this quality discussion has been ground well plowed and we've been through it. And so some of this is back to outcomes. And we're hoping that kids going through our education system come out prepared. And we have preparation standards. We discussed them. I think we just talked higher graduation, lower prep scores. I mean, it's what we're seeing right now. We have endless number of examples. I would say every person that's in business, North Carolina, I ran a facility where we're hiring people out of high school and we needed to have six month English and for written and math classes. So they could be prepared to work in a new statistical environment in a manufacturing facility. And we would hire people, and then we would pay them to go to these classes before they were able to work on the line. Now, they had high school graduation certificates, but by no means had that high school prepared them or the whole schooling system for even that job. And so we see this over and over again. And we're doing those kids no favor by giving them a certificate but not giving them the education. At the end of the day, it's gonna be the education that you rely on. And so I, I don't think this is like new stuff, but what's happened here for now literally decades is that we have a group of our citizens that are not getting the education they deserve. It's a, a group that continues not to get the education. It is also income level and it's just self-fulfilling. And we are trapping people in this endless cycle because if you're poor, you don't get the education. And the only way to get out of being poor is through an education. And so somehow we got to go get after this. If we don't like income disparities, which we shouldn't like the way they're moving, then you've got to really get after education. If you look at all the stats, and we like to divide people in 1% and this percent and that percent, but what the real division is, if you have a college or some college or you don't, you have very different outcomes. It's foundational. And this could be different kind of vocational schooling and others as well. But we have to understand that there's a correlation. It's unarguable, to be quite honest, that education matters in a big way. And we also have a huge disservice to a number of people. So I sort of get this political will and everything else. I sort of go, I, what, what's hard, and I grew up in Minnesota. I went to high school in Minneapolis Public Schools, West High School. It's been torn down. <laughs> and they built a retirement village there, which is kind of a statement, isn't it? But anyway, so maybe I'll end up there, who knows? The, 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 the point, you know, even public schools, we, we've got to figure out how to break this log jam. And we do have political interests on either side, but there's gotta be enough will so this morning I started my day off with a close by close the gaps by five meeting. And I've been working 15 years on early childhood education. It was on MELF, Minnesota Early Learning Foundation, where we came up with the targeted scholarships. Let's give money to those kids most in need first. If you take care of their needs, then we can start talking about giving money to other people. But we need to make sure that those needs are met. We haven't met half of them yet been 15 years of conversation. Now, we won't give up. If it takes another 15 years. We'll keep pounding to get this done. Let's hope not. But we can't take 15 years here. I mean, we really need to get after this and have some will. I will say this. I don't think there's one person I've met in the partnership, not like we get everything done we want, God knows, but I know there's really strong resolve that this is a very smart means to create the catalyst that can force some of the change that we need. And so we are gonna make this one of our top agenda items, right? In a way, because it's right for the kids. And I wanna get to, I, you know, this isn't, this isn't self-serving in the sense of like our businesses are gonna blossom. What's gonna happen though is our societies are gonna decay if we don't get after this. And there's no way you can have a strong Minneapolis, St. Paul, or Minnesota, or United States if you don't fix this education disparity problem. It is a cancer. 
And so how are we going to get after this? And I would say there's very strong resolve to make this pri the priority. We hope we get it done this year. We aren't going to all go home and quit next year if it takes next year. And so we do have to get smart. We do have to attack it. But I would also say just going to make it a priority and understand we are going to figure out how to get this darn thing done. And I will salute you guys for being the catalyst of the catalyst. <laughs> Just one additional point on quality. I, I think it's who makes the measures, but then what are they used for? Are they punitive? Are they to improve, quali improve quality? And, and for whom? Is it an institutional measure? Is it an individual measure? One of the things that has really worked well at UMR in Rochester, again, no disparities at all in performance, 100% graduation rates, and they're employed or going to graduate school. Individual counselors working with students throughout their time. It's working. It is working. We have seen, we have good research, and it is by different groups, et cetera. It's valid and reliable. And I just say, let's not let measurement be a boogeyman. Let's me let measurement be a tool for continuous quality improvement with an open spirit of learning. How do we do that? Right now, for many, it's fear-mongering, and that's not what it should be. Yeah, and I just want to add on that. Uh, on quality, we should also be uh, looking at equity, too. And one prime example was, was I, when, I was, when I started grade school, my parents uh, had me go to a school in St. Anthony Park, the wealthier part of St. Paul. And then after a couple of years, they took me out after some incidents to a school from an all-white all school to an all-minority majority school by my by the third grade. And the education I got there, I could tell it was, it was night and day. I was learning what I had already learned from um, the all-white school. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about uh, pouring, pouring in just more fundings into our schools, um, that's not equity. We have to look at the policy. We have to look at who needs uh, the resources more. Is it at school where I was learning at a third grade level or a school where I was still learning at third grade level? Well, I want to follow up, um, Representative Zhang. Uh, educators are often asked to do more with less. This is also a question from Pigeonhole. How can this effort help teaching and school leadership become more attractive, supported careers where people have what they need to succeed? Do you have a perspective on that? I'd ask a number of you to respond. So you I'll, I'll just say that as a foreign educator, I made nothing. <laughs> we have to pay more uh, to retain quality, uh, good teachers. Uh, they need to make a living. It's uh, it's embarrassing when educators have to um, be on public assistance uh, to make ends meet. When I was when I was teaching, I had to buy books and clothes for my children. I was working with uh, immigrants and refugee students. I mean, it's sad. Uh, I, 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 don't, I don't come from a privileged background where I could go to my mom and dad for some extra income to uh, make ends meet. We have to do more uh, for our educators uh, equally uh, when we talk about our students too. And let me just say, we spend a lot of money in education. <laughs> we spend an abundance of money in education to yet we are not getting the outcomes for all kids that we want. And so there are some things that are just not working that we continue to be so close-minded about the solutions of how we're going to achieve better outcomes for the kids who are failing. You know, it's, it's heartbreaking to have a child enter the whatever grade at whatever level, and six months in, a year later, they have not in increased any of those gains. That is about looking at that child and saying, this is where you are, this is where you, we want you to be, this is where you need to be, and work individually, find a, find a solution to ensure that every individual child has, is gaining some type of growth, the learning growth that is needed to move on, if it's the third grade, to move on to the fourth grade. And so I'm just going to say uh, uh, again and just talk about because you know we you see data around the promised neighborhoods, you know, and what the promised neighborhood looks like in St. Paul and Minneapolis or Red Wing uh, or St. Cloud, it's different. 
but this whole this type of partnership, talking about you know a grassroots movement and partnerships to help the nonprofit, the philanthropic, the business entity, and have the state investment in what is needed. That is great outcomes, better outcomes. And so there are things that are working, but we we have to continue to look at ec uh, equity and fairness. Mm -hmm. I, I like a little justice to be here sometimes, you know? You know, let's, let's look at that a little bit. Um, but just keep our eyes on the children, you know, and you, you can't punish a school for having bad outcomes when kids are mobile, they're homeless, they're transit, and you expect the same type of outcome for that school as you would a school in Edina. It's unfair, it's, it's, it just doesn't make any sense at all, but we create policies that lead to practices where schools are being penalized. No, the kids in the schools are being penalized. And yes, we have to invest in teachers, we have to invest in social workers, we need more counselors. Um, trauma is real, kids are experiencing that. We have some of the highest suicide rates um, among our, 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 our students. You know, beginning at the age of 10. Do you know that outcome? of the suicide rates among children. So things that, those are things that, you, you know, that we have to address in the 21st century. So I just ask that as we leave this space that we reimagine and just rethink. Let's leave that 1800 model behind and begin to think about what it is that we need to do today in the 21st century and to really ensure the outcomes that we need for every black and brown child Right, because we want to be that world best workforce. Families and kids want to be self-sufficient. They want to take care of themselves. They want their kids to do better. But there are many different factors that sometimes we don't want to discuss that is leading to the outcomes that we see when we don't invest in that growth, that development, looking at the mental health pieces. There's many different factors. And we have to do that right now in the 21st century. It's not just saying, you know, well, that's the parent's responsibility, or that's that church, or the, maybe we get the church to do that. We have to look at our educational system through a different lens, and it's going to take each and every one of us to do that. It's not somebody else's problem. It is all of our problems to do that, and so including engaging our parents in a real way that they feel comfortable, they feel supportive, they feel that they have the tools that they need to be the number one advocate for their child. Thank you. I think this will be the final okay. comment, and then we're going to wrap up this panel. Well, I think we are an amazing state, a state of great increasing diversity, and that with that comes a responsibility. We're also a state of great employers um, who invented things, who have great innovation, who use systems engineering to drive solutions. And I think it's time, if we're going to really put the child at the center, we have to take a systems approach to that child. We can't just say it's all the teachers, it's the parents, it's, it's all parts of government too. It's the human service delivery system. And to force government to be more integrated too in how it approaches service delivery. We're trying to do this in Rochester with our homelessness. People would say for us, oh, that's the county's problem. Oh, it's the city's problem. We say, no, it's everyone's problem. And together with a systems mindset and the capabilities of systems thinking and system engineering, we can, we can drive to zero homelessness. So maybe I would just urge too, we don't look at this as an isolated thing, but really a governmental broad-based systems approach to when we put that child at the center. Thank you. Thank you. Well, please join me in thanking our distinguished panelists.